Welcome back to the Thought Leadership Series here at Online Marketing TV. We are joined by Jay Bear and Amber. Um, welcome, guys. Guys, let's um, let's just start big picture and then dive in. Um, social media, everybody's talking about it. We all know about it. We got to be doing things about it. But uh, what seems to be happening now is a lack of priorities. Mm -hmm. Meaning, how do you do first things first in this ever-changing world? Do you have any some general advice or your theories about how to prioritize your efforts and then mm -hmm. kind of we'll start drilling into some best practices? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a couple of things. One is, is we really believe that you need to figure out what it is you're trying to achieve yeah. in, in social media as a company, right? Are you trying to build awareness? Are you trying to drive sales? Are you trying to generate loyalty? Figure out how social media fits into your actual sort of company objectives and then pick success metrics. Operationalizing of social um, the the listening layer has to really be the the start because that's what sort of gives you the idea of where you're starting from. Right. Um, are people talking about you? What are they saying? Is it good, uh, bad, or indifferent? And if they're not talking about you, what are they talking about? So understanding that lay of the land is actually the first place you have to start in order to know where to go from that point forward. So when you're understanding the lay of the land, right, obviously with your background at Radiant 6, mm -hmm. what, what are some of the first things you should be looking at or setting up as some monitoring metrics so you can get a sense for, you know, what it looks like out there before you got to go deep and hard, you know, sure. something just to give you a quick scan? Sure. Well, we look at it in kind of three different layers. So we start with brand, right, and that's the, the me-focused stuff. Is somebody talking about us? Um, how often are they talking? What are they saying? What channels are they using to talk about them in? So what media types are they, are they uh, conversing in? And sort of the overall sentiment of that. Is it positive? Is it negative? Are they right. uh, indifferent? Um, and then if you take it a layer above that, you might add in broader industry conversations. So what are people, what trends are people hooking on to? Or what's happening in our industry? And then uh, at the third layer, you might add competitive analysis into it. So all of the same metrics apply, um, but it's the lenses that actually tend to change Got over it. time. And I love that because a lot of people forget it's not about this social ecosphere. It's like, where are they specifically? Are they yeah. reading the blogs? Are they on Twitter? I mean, because they may well not be, especially a lot of the B2B guys. They just kind of hope that they're out there and then start shooting things well, from I mean, the, the reality is a lot of people are trying to access information about a particular type of product. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but much fewer, far fewer people are actually naming that product. Mm -hmm. in their social conversations, right? Yeah. So if you're only looking for mentions of your company name, you're really only getting the tip of the spear. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. You, you talk about industry or category right. much more than you do brand. Right, only when you're tweeting the hashtag for OMS, yeah. right? Right, then, of course. Right, right. Then Obviously. you put all hashtag the Hashtag OMS 11, 12, 13, 14. Well, what's really important about that in a marketing context is that we as companies speak in a brand language that we've developed and we use words that we want other people to use when they're talking like about brand. Like brand. Uh, but people don't talk that way. Right. So the listening has to reflect the language that's of the right. people we're actually listening to, right. and that's a, an important tweak, I think. Which which is awesome for, we were just kind of joking about it, but for SEO. I mean, that's if right. you yeah. can get some of those keywords to understand what people are actually saying exactly. the acronyms are using, that's what they're typing in, and that's where that little goal between the cracks is to really Absolutely. bid for those keyword phrases. Definitely. That's yeah, good. Totally. Good. So let's talk a little bit about user-generated content. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some of you guys uh, or your presentations in the past, and would like to know your theory on how to leverage user-generated content for your own website, some of the best practices and uh, for all the folks out there. On One the of board. my favorite examples, and I think there was actually a, a presentation about this by uh, our friend Chris Baggett at, uh, at OMS uh, 11, uh, is a company called Western River, and they do whitewater rafting expeditions across all kinds of different rivers, and they have this amazing program where they take their uh, reservation system, and they bolt it together with a blogging software compendium and with Exact Target's email system. It's all sort of Frankenstein together. But the way it works is you you get back from the trip. Hold on, was that your way of saying the technology wasn't really well, working? <laughs> no, the technology is great, but, but they, they that's they, all they, disparate they, systems. No, yeah, these guys pioneered it, right? So they had to sort of make their own middleware. They had to kind right. of like um, is that called an export button? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it's, it's, it's yeah. really it's a it's a great system because let's say you come back from a trip, you get an email the day you return that says, Aaron. Uh, we hope you love the trip down the Snake River. Um, click a button and tell us what your favorite memory was mm. and upload your very best photo. Yeah. So you click the button, you go to a web form, you fill it out, upload your photo. That web form automatically gets turned into a blog post. Then it automatically gets posted to their Facebook page. Then they trigger another email to you that says, hey, we liked your, your message so much, we made a blog post out of it and it's on Facebook. Share it with your friends. So you have this instantaneous, automatic story harvesting engine, yeah. which also has social sharing built into it. And they're generating 1,200 blog posts a quarter 
through that program. You yeah. know, and once you get the software dialed in, it costs them nothing. That, that's a great thing, and it, it points out what a lot of people have fear of, which is the filter for yeah. all this. There, there are filters there. You know, you're not just like right. the world common or anything. You wouldn't, you know? So it's a good reminder that you actually do have some control over the situation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's no different than asking people to contribute to your um, your regular company collateral kind right. of thing. It, it, you can build in sort of moderation mechanisms to make sure that that's the way that you want it to be. Right. But uh, there's no question that the people who actually live and breathe your products and services are going to tell your story oftentimes better than you are. Yeah. The reality is every time somebody emails your customer service department, right. that's a potential customer story. Yeah. Oh. N not always positive, but it's a potential customer story that can be harvested and put out on the social web and search optimized. Sure. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about where your head is going for the rest of this year. What, what are you most excited about? There's all sorts of things to be excited about, but what's top of mind in terms of, I can't wait to dig into this? Mm, I think mine would have to be uh, watching the culture shift that's happening. Yes, yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm a girl, so I the, the whole touchy-feely sensitive thing really gets to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the idea There's that, a small crocodile tear <laughs> coming right down here, her cheek. Right here. Um, no, but really, I think it's, it's actually very inspiring to see companies really rethinking not just their people and their processes and, and the operational side of the way they do things, but why they do things, and yeah. really digging deep into the, why do we care about this? Why are we passionate about what we're doing? Um, why are our people passionate about what we're doing? I love it. The, the behavioral changes we're seeing Huge. on a humanistic side. It doesn't have really anything to do specifically with social. This is the vehicle of which that's helping accelerate right. that change. Yeah. It's awesome. It's really cool. So one of the questions um, that's uh, a favorite here on the show is talking about how you handle the humanistic change, right? This blend of personal and professional lives. What's your strategy? Let's take Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. on how you allow that blend to happen. Um, and kind of share with us, you know, what might be some good insights for others that are trying to, you know, figure that out. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that that difference is fading away yeah. because ultimately your personal life is much more interesting than your professional life, <laughs> unless you're an astronaut or a sword swallower. <laughs> Those are the two other examples that don't apply. But but the fact that the fact that you uh, run conferences, yeah. right, is mildly interesting, yeah. right? But what's more oh, I interesting... I Yeah, well, see, so it depends. It depends. interesting, let but, me tell but, you. you know, <laughs> but, but your relationship with your son and the things that you do and where you travel is much more interesting. Like, there's a reason that my bio, the first two words in my bio are tequila loving. Really? They always have been, Yeah. right? Because people remember that. People come up to me all the time, you're the tequila guy yeah. more than you're the social media guy. Yeah. Do you really right? want that, though? I do, because, okay. because you know, you're, you're, you're building... A personal brand. I'm not a huge fan of that of that nomenclature. I feel it's a little Stunning, icky, flicky. Yeah. but 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 that's true, right? That you right. want to give people something memorable, the same way you would if you were an actual company. Like, what right. is the one thing that people are going to remember you for? And, and and the same thing is true personally. So, are you more passionate about tequila than you are social media? Well, social media. <laughs> I'm looking for authenticity now. Right? Social media yeah, pays better. See? Social media pays better. <laughs> that way, yeah. more, your bank account's more passionate that's, about social that's right, media. That's right. That's right. Well, I I mean I think the the, the Giving dimension to your online presence is actually really important yeah, because yeah. the people that work with me at Radiant 6 also know that I'm a mom and that I'm a horseback rider and that I'm a musician. Yeah. And those things have affinity points. Renaissance woman. Yeah, I totally Not all at the same time, though, because that's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> I guess a little dangerous. That's in. just crazy. <laughs> Holding the kid with the flute on the horse. I actually have pictures of that somewhere, but... Um, th I think it's actually really important to, to smush those together. So I have all my online presences are both personal and professional. And yes, there's risk associated with it. Yeah. Yes, there's times where I have to delete something that I would have ordinarily posted, you know, but it, that's that's the reality of today. And yeah. I'm cool with that. Yeah. I don't, for example, have a Facebook fan page for my business. Yeah. I just have my, my yeah, page. page right? Yeah, I mean, I may at some point, but to me, it's just at this juncture, it feels like splitting hairs. Yeah. Okay. We have one for the book. We have a Facebook fan page for our book, yep. but but not one for Convince and Convert, and she doesn't have one for, you know, that's, Amber. That's a good question. I like to talk about the, the Facebook page strategy, right? Because especially with the big companies out yeah. there, all of these pages, you know, now we got the tabs. Are you guys seeing anything seem to work out yet? It's a challenge because ultimately Facebook is interested in their profit, not yours. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so they're not benevolent, right? right? And, and so, you know, if you thought about, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create this whole system that essentially requires you to make a microsite right. uh, and we're not going to really give you any authentication or login, sort of one person controls it and right. we're going to change our mind all the time. And how's that? You right. know, if, if you if you pitch that today, <laughs> yeah. you'd be like, this is insanity. Yeah. But yet everybody's grabbing it. Like, we got to do Facebook. We got to do Facebook. And, right. and the reality is most Facebook fan pages are, are simply yellow pages 2.0. Yeah. One, because there's really not any engagement points there right. with customers. Right. And two, 
customers don't come back. I mean, you think yeah. about how you use yeah. Facebook, how any of us use Facebook. You, you like a brand, right, and, and you click one finger. Yeah. It's not exactly a blood oath, right? It's one right. click with one finger. Right. And then how often do you go back to that fan page? Right. Very well, I like, your, I like yeah. your analogy of uh, bumper stickering, digital bumper digital stickering. Digital bumper stickering. And yeah. the reality is that most often we like a company on Facebook because we already like them. Right. It's it's sort of an affirmation of our That's endorsement. Right. It's not an initial touch point. So I think it's really important for companies to keep in mind yeah. that it's a it's it's there and it's important to maybe be present, yeah. but yeah. that it's not the end all be all. And if you upend your entire online existence yeah. for that, you're really losing your own home turf advantage. But the way to do it though is to take that affinity, right, and and double down on it. To take affinity and turn it into passion right. by giving customers assignments yeah. in yeah. Facebook. Like get them psyched, get them involved. I look at a company like Bulbstorm, which has their idea challenges application where you can actually go in there and come up with ideas and vote on them and people have prizes and, and it really is like, there's like a whole self contained mechanism where yeah. people are like getting psyched the about Crayola like, let's do something. similar to that too. They yeah. do some really cool yeah. back to the user generated content thing. Yeah. It's like they're handing over the Facebook page to the people who are actually a part of it. Which is Facebook is great for us because it helps deepen the relationships. Right. Sure. It isn't usually, almost never, the initial relationship. No, it's because as Amber said, why, why would that be? Like, let me yeah. just go through Facebook and randomly <laughs> yeah. like companies. Yeah, it's no, just crazy. Yeah. No, no. Well, and if you think about that too, when it comes to like mobile, we had a we had this mobile uh, roundtable in here yesterday, and it was fascinating because it's about that sales cycle overall right. in these different very engaging places we talked about the pillow strategy which is people sleep with their mobile phone you're actually marketing to them you know yeah. under their yes. pillow yes, right yeah. so it's, it's just a great spot to do it i think the attribution piece is always difficult sure. but people need to understand some of the impact of that and that's no different than it's always been yeah, i mean how do right. we attribute our billboards or our press releases or whatever too i mean yeah our sales agency says your brand lift was this and yeah. oh we're great yeah, but exactly. our, you know our sa sales are <laughs> holistic and they're they're impacted by several touch points so if we get comfortable with that we can get comfortable with social being just another one of If yeah, for some reason people are trying to trying to apply a deeper level of mathematical proof to yeah. social media than they have any yeah. other tactic before and I think it's because people are scared of social media so right. they use it's not measurable as a defense mechanism. Well, yeah, I agree with that, but I would even go as far as saying that's for everything online because yeah. now we got a little bit of data, right? Yeah. And now it's like, oh, we got a little bit of data, we should be able to track everything. And no, you cannot track everything. I have yet to get one good answer on how attribution is handled across the board for right. every one of your marketing efforts. And if it was, would we all have jobs? Yeah. No, right. you would just let the machine tell you yeah, what right. you should do, right? right? We right. Would, we, there'd be no right. marketers well, out there. I, my, my friend Todd Webster talks about there's a difference between information and evidence. Yes. And we have a swaths of information that are right. out there, but they're not necessarily telling us anything of value until we can start digging deep into that information. But that requires a human brain right. to an extent to be able to you know, map out the paths between the obvious points of data Right. Well, to get even close takes a lot of work, right? Yeah. At some point, you have to ask yourself this question. What's the ROI of measuring ROI? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, right. and, you know, measurement itself is not the goal. That's right. part of right. the other thing. Right. That so many companies are like, woohoo, we measured. Right. And it's like supporting what, what? now where are you going to spend your money? I mean, right. I, I, are you making I, decisions based on that measurement that you're then taking all the way back to the beginning of the cycle and yeah. then putting into practice in your business? That's the That's goal. the key. Right? What right. are you doing with that data? Exactly. I keep asking everybody, and there's a little bit of that blank stare. Like, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> you know, we're getting well, there. Well, think about it. I mean, you and I have been doing digital marketing for a lot longer than it looks on camera because we're so youthful. <laughs> but, but I mean, think about, you know, the original the original Web Trends reports, right? Here's yeah. 34 pages of, oh, you know, God. screen you know, file. Here's right. how exactly. many colors the average, you know, monitor who comes to our site gets. I'm right. like, right. Yeah, and? exactly, right. So right. what am I going to do with that yeah. information? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I think that's key is just deciding what you want to do with it and how that aligns back right. to the business goals. Um, let's talk about your, your book. I want to know a little bit more about it. You guys just launched it today? Yesterday. Yes. Yesterday, yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Awesome. So tell me about the, the key tenets of the book, a little bit about what people will walk away when they read this thing. Well, so we wrote, uh, it's called The Now Revolution, and it's about seven shifts to make your company faster, smarter, and more social, the official subtitle. And what we're really talking about is actually social from the inside out, so how to re-engineer your business to adapt to what the real-time web has done. Mm. So there's seven different shifts that we talk about in the book, and um, they're Corporate all- Corporate culture, yeah, internal we, social media, listening, response, crisis management, success metrics, all that kind of stuff. Cool, it, it's HR. Really, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's really the idea about having um, changes to people and process and the way we do business in order to respond to social media. So it's not so much a how to do social media book, but it's a how to be social. How to be social as an organization. Yes. I like I like that philosophy because they got to start with a platform and then do versus just kind of 
chopping apart and you know executing on these little things as you right. go. That's right. great. So when you guys wrote the book, who carried all the weight? It's who funny. Was, we didn't. Who actually, was the, who was the no, slacker? No, the, the reality this? is, it's, it's really funny. It's almost exactly. 50-50, like really? literally at the word level. Like it's like 25,000 words each kind of thing. And so one of the challenges that we have for readers is to email us uh, and, and, and tell us who they think wrote each chapter. So our goal is to make sure that no one can tell who wrote what parts. Wrote, yeah. So what kind of voice do you have? Are you guys going like, to have a, a unified name? Are you going to have an email address that's Jamber at? No, it's, uh, <laughs> Jamber, Jamber, Jamber at. Jamber at. <laughs> I, think it's, I, think it's, uh, I think it's info at is the uh, yeah. info at nowrevolutionbook.com is the... Uh, is the quiz yeah address. and it really i mean it was we're lucky in the sense that uh we the reason this made sense to begin with is that jay and i share a lot of very similar philosophies about our approach to all this and we have similar sort of point of fact voices and it's it worked out well for us i think cool. great great that's exciting so um in the final question here i want to kind of break down the barriers for everybody that's watching right sure. so we're talking business we're talking social media but you guys are pretty open on your Facebook pages, but share with us maybe one thing I might not see on your wall or in your profile and your pictures that most people don't know about that you're, you're pretty excited about when it comes to your personal life. So that personal, professional, brand this is, this combination. This is the test yeah. of the blend, about. you know? Right, go. Uh, for me, it's definitely the fact that I'm a mom. Yeah. Uh, I'm a single mom and I have an almost four-year-old daughter and she's my grounding force in life. So I don't, I don't share a lot about her online because I, you know, I hope her personal privacy is her own choice someday. Right. But she is definitely someday, not today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she's based, based on the tenet right. of the now revolution. I'm going to say that's probably unlikely. Yeah. But, well, but okay. and actually, you will find pictures of her on my Facebook page because I break my own rule occasionally. But she is definitely the thing that keeps me going. Very cool. Very cool. I got to know. So you lived in the Phoenix area, right? Yep. And you moved to Indianapolis. I moved yeah. to Bloomington, Indiana. Bloomington, Bloomington Indiana. Indiana, where the university is, where IU is. Why the bleep did you move to Bloomington, <laughs> Indiana? And there's got to be a story or a reason behind okay, that. You want, the, you want the real story? Okay, of course. So so, we're here for so, the real story, Jay. Uh, <laughs> Bloomington is actually a terrific, terrific college town, sort of in the in the vein of uh, yeah. But you're far from Ann Arbor, or, uh, yeah. <laughs> good point. Oh, well ouch. said. Ouch. <laughs> ouch. But we do like that. Uh, we like that style. We were in Flagstaff before we moved yeah. uh, to uh, to Bloomington. Which so is also you like young town. girls, is basically. What That's you're it. That's exactly right. And cheap beer. That's and, and lots of pizza places. Um, oh. We're going to talk about who likes young girls. Let's just switch the interview and see here a little bit. Um, so this is really how we did it. You'll appreciate this. So my wife and I said, look, you know, we've been in Arizona forever, um, and maybe let's try somewhere else. And so we rank ordered the priorities that were important to us. College town, under 100,000 people, good schools, low cost of living, good tax structure, access to health care, as much as I travel, close to an airport. Uh, and I wanted good to be... good tax structure in there? Really? I did. Did you guys really look at that and go, oh, yes. check, good yes. tax well, structure. you know, you got to think. Bloomington's still on the list. Think. Here we go. Uh, and good colleges, too. Um, and, and also, I wanted to be more a little bit in the middle of the country just yeah. because, you know, being in Eugene, Oregon or Hilton Head or whatever, it's hard to fly that far. So right. there's websites, Best Places is one of them, and a couple others that we used where you put that stuff in and it, like, do, 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 triangulates and it, yeah. and it recommends cities. And so we kept using all these websites and it kept saying Bloomington. Bloomington, yes. and we're like, all right. So are we you sure these aren't paid for <laughs> Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, yeah. right? You know? Bloomington CVB, like a super insidious <laughs> online marketing program, which would be brilliant. Everything um, you put in gives Bloomington. <laughs> <laughs> back. High crime Population rate. Population doubles yeah, in a year. Rate, yeah. <laughs> Lots of heroin use, um, and, and so it kept young, girls, young, young girls, young girls, <laughs> young girls. Yeah. So we went out there and uh, and didn't know anybody and looked around and said, hey, we, we really like this town. It's a really high cultural level, great people, and, and uh, boom. Really? It was yeah. just that? Ah, just very cool. Happen. Great. That's a great way to end it. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Appreciate the time. Thanks. And uh, hope to see you guys back Thank soon. You bet. Yeah. Good to see you. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Yep.